Thank you very much for coming. I am Prit Banerjee. I am uh, CTO at ANSYS. So I have two roles here, one to be the host for the evening and also to moderate a panel. And so uh, ANSYS and, and I have partnered on this very exciting panel uh, session together. And I would like uh, Ravi to say a few words about the Hive and introduce what the concept is, and then I will be right back. Good action, Maddie, and then okay. I'll go after that. I'm just going to say a couple things about the Hive Think Tank. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight and for dealing with the traffic. You still made it. Thanks so much. We're so excited for tonight's talk on digital twins and semiconductors. Uh, so, a little bit about the Hive Think Tank. We are basically a platform that uh, launches events as well as content. And our content you can find on Medium and our events for you here right now. And you can also track them on social media at our handle Hive Data. Also, you can track us through the hashtag Hive Data. And our events are all about AI, enterprise, big data, 5G. We have a ton of different tracks that are super exciting. And we bring together entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and corporations, such as Answer tonight. Um, and these are our wonderful partners that help sponsor the Hive Think Tank. If you guys want to find out more about how to get involved with the Hive Think Tank or have your company get involved, please find me after the event. And these are a little bit more about our tracks. So we have eight different tracks that cover a bunch of uh, different things, including AI, like I was mentioning before, 5G, uh, FinTech and InsureTech, Health, uh, IOT and a few other things as well. And we have a very interesting event coming up that is not showing up on here. Okay, but that's all right. I'm going to tell you about it anyways. It's on, it's on December 5th and it's going to be on business process transformation. And that's going to be at SAP in Palo Alto. And that is going to be online on our meetup very shortly. So just stay tuned. If you're subscribed to our newsletter, you'll get the notification. And please sign up for that. That's going to be a really good event. So without further ado, I would like to pass the microphone to TM Ravi, who is the managing director for the Hive. Thank you, Thank you Maggie. So a number of people here asked who is the, what is the Hive and so forth. So I'll give you a very brief introduction. So the Hive is a venture capital fund. But it, it, there are lots of different kinds of venture capital funds. So this is something that's often called a venture studio. So we fund like venture capital, but we get involved with companies very at a very early stage. And, and so in about three-fourths of the companies we've been involved before the company was actually started collaborating with the entrepreneurs. And, and, and so we have a strong operating team. So I see our CTO, where is he? Mohan Reddy there. Uh, uh, Kamesh is our chief product officer. So the kinds of roles that that you don't see in a venture, typically in a venture capital. Uh, we are also very focused. We are focused on applications, use cases of data-related techniques, you know, NLP, NLU, computer vision, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. Uh, in the enterprise in a few key vertical segments. And, and so we're very thematic. So we think a lot about workflows and business processes around security, privacy as part of digital risk. Um, we have a strong presence in, in industry foro. We have a number of very successful companies, some of which have been acquired. Um, ambient intelligence is bringing kind of intelligence to the edge, and, and so uh, doing a lot of things there and around life sciences and, and healthcare. So a uh, large portfolio of companies are there, and one of our companies is, is going to be featured today is on the panel, Geminis. It's a digital twin, and I'd like to uh, Karthik say more about that. And so with that, I'd like to welcome you and introduce Prit Banerjee. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick uh, uh, background about Prit. Prit is, of course, CTO of ANSYS. He has a very distinguished career, both in industry and in academia. And uh, Prit, I'm rattling this off the top of my uh, head, so I may miss some of that. So he was uh, CTO of Schneider Electric. He was the, uh, the CTO and head of Accenture and Accenture Labs. Uh, he was the CTO of 
uh, ABB. Uh, before that, he headed up HP Labs. He was a faculty member in a number of different institutions in the University of uh, Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, where I was actually born, in the Carl Memorial Hospital. <laughs> and and so, so uh, highly sort of distinguished. <coughs> So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Fred to bring the kind of panelists on. Thank but you. I yeah. think you, uh, how do you plan to do the Q&A? you want it in this first? You're doing it in the end. We'll do that in the end. So again, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining. And, and I have had a long uh, history of connection with the Hive. Uh, when, as Ravi was mentioning, when I was uh, at Accenture, we had some partnership with some of the startups that he had when I was uh, at Schneider Electric. Again, we had more partnership with startups. So I have seen how the Hive model, they take uh, one startup at a time. And they work with the startup, make it successful, recruit some senior members, and then takes over. Right now, he is the CEO of the current startup, which is sort of incubating. And then he will take off, and he will take the next startup, and he will incubate. So it's a very, very interesting model. And so I think this is a, a, a good uh, event to be associated with. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Rafael, for participating. So, so we decided to have a, an interesting topic today on, on digital twins. And uh, the figure. So people have been talking about the concept of digital twins for, uh, for a while. And I wanted to first of all introduce the topic, then I'll introduce the panelists. So, So, uh, as Ravi mentioned, I used to be CTO at ABB, CTO at Schneider. These companies make large industrial assets, assets like transformers. These transformers are huge. They will cost about a million dollars. In some large assets, they cost a million dollars. Now, when these assets are sitting in the, in the field, they can fail. Now, what we typically do, uh, in, in these kind of things is you, you, you put them these large assets on a preventive maintenance thing. Right? You, you see, well, uh, typically a thing will fail after year, 10 years, whatever, and just like you, you take your car for an oil change every 5,000 miles, you try to say, okay, I need to replace the oil every 5,000 miles. Now, when you do it on a regular basis, why 5,000 miles? It's based on collecting a lot of data on oil in cars, all kinds of cars, and so on, and different driving conditions, they say every 5,000 miles, you need to replace your oil. But it turns out that there are these very good drivers where if you drive very carefully, like David Lee, he drives very carefully, you, you could afford to, I'm just teasing because I have friends in the audience here. <laughs> David Lee, uh, he heads up the networking lab. He was my colleague when I was to head up HP lab, so I can tease him. So the point is, David is a very good, careful driver. He can afford to replace his oil every 7,000 miles. Whereas I am a crazy, wacky driver. I'm just going fast on 101 and braking and doing all, all these things. For me, I need to change my car oil maybe every 3,000 miles. 
So depending on that asset, depending on the environmental condition, you need to come up with a, a maintenance mechanism called condition maintenance, which is really right for that, that time, right? So people have been talking about the concept of a digital twin. Here is the car, the actual car in real life. If I can have a model of the car, which is a digital a, a prototype of that car through a simulation model, they can, as soon as the car is, the, the real car is driving on 101 or whatever, but I'm also simulating the driving of the car, right? As it's going through, and periodically I'm checking what is happening to the car through an IoT being a connected car platform. And I keep my simulation version of the car very accurate with the real version. If I could do it really, really accurately, then I can have a digital twin of a aircraft flying out in space and I know exactly where some things can go wrong. That has huge value. So people have talked about using the concept of digital twins with purely getting what is called operational data. You measure how frequently things fail and you collect data and based on it you say, okay, uh, I think it's going to fail next Thursday. Based on it, this whole area of what is called predictive analytics have come in and based on it, they do predictive maintenance. Means, oh, when is, I think it will fail next Thursday, therefore let me replace that part on Wednesday. The accuracy of that predictive analytics is about 60, 65%. When I was at ABB, at Schneider, we found through our IoT platform, we were collecting a lot of data, but when you are predicting this is going to fail, the accuracy of that is 60-65%. Now, if you have a $1 part, 60% error, no problem. If it's a million dollar part, you make a 60% accuracy, 40% error means you just made a $400,000 mistake to replace a part that should not have been replaced. Or you made a mistake and you, 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 you said it's not going to fail, but it fails, that's a million dollar mistake or a lot more because that Anything that costs you a million dollars is probably driving a hundred million dollar business. So in either end of the spectrum, making a mistake is not a big symptom. So people have been talking about that data-driven analytics is not an accurate enough thing, except in certain cases, when you have very, very frequently occurring events, then doing it based on data analytics is good, but when you have infrequent events, then you need to rely on simulation-based analytics, which is sort of the whole field of digital twins and so on. Now, people have been talking about digital twins now for a wide range of assets. And just to give you, if we could crack this problem, and I know we are in Silicon Valley, right? There's a bunch of people here are thinking, hey, let me get an idea for a startup. This is actually a big market. There are 1.6 billion industrial assets in the world that should be monitored and tracked for, for predictive analytics. Are they monitored today? No, only 0.1% is monitored. But the opportunity is 99% of all the stuff, all the transformers, all the switch gear, all these cars, jet engines, locomotive, everything, if you could monitor them, that has value. The value of these things in terms of industrial investments in IoT is $80 billion, right? Are people, you going to use digital twins? You ask executives, 50% of people say that. Oh my God, that is a big market. So if you are trying to come up with a startup, doing a unicorn, this is, seems like a good, good idea, right? Then you look at the simulation model. The other answer is, why are we interested? Because the simulation opportunity in just this area is about 3.3 billion. We are today a, a company with about $1.5 billion business. Our TAM is about six billion, and we are always looking for what other opportunities are there. This is one of the big opportunities for us to do, right? So if you can crack this down, it'll be interesting things will happen. So that's the market opportunity. And so the question is, who would be interested? If you could be, if you're a startup doing this kind of thing, right? Who would be interested? You could sell this technology to companies, to CEOs. CEOs are always interested in two things. One is grow top line revenue or grow safe costs, right? Grow your bottom line. Top line or bottom line. It turns out with digital twins, you can do both. 
An example of a top line is, today is a, I'm a company, I'm a CEO, I sell compressors. Now through the digital twin of that compressor, I can actually change the business model of selling compressors. Instead of selling compressors for $100,000 per pop, right? I will sell compressed air as a service. Because I can really monitor that compressed air going through, etc. I, I know so much about that air and the compressor. I don't have to sell you a compressor. I can sell compressed air as a service, which is a whole new sort of business outcome. And the CEO of that compressor company becomes super rich. So you have added to his top line. Or you're a CEO of a company like Phoenix Contact, and you're selling relays and switches and so on, and through the digital twin, you can predict when this thing is going to fail, and because of it, the cost goes down, and you have added to this bottom line. That's good. Or if you are a third level company, that you, you are Rockwell Automation. Everybody is doing things one way, and so Schneider, Honeywell, uh, ADB, they're doing things one way, they're doing automation, and now I do it based on digital twin of industry 4.0. Wow, I have, I have a different here. Every company will start using Rockwell's products. So the point is that using digital twins, you can increase top line, bottom line, and new business model. So if you could crack it, amazing things will happen. So it turns out that the pure analytics-based approach has its challenges, and now I'm going to accelerate, right? Because it takes a lot of time to collect data. To get really accurate data, it takes forever, right? Not only that, you will sometimes you will not, now not even be able to collect enough data to make a prediction. For example, Space Shuttle Channel Challenger had an explosion based on some things that happened with the Thiokol rockets, etc., etc. Right? No amount of predictive analytics would predict the fact that that space shuttle would would, would, would explode because it happened only once in a 20-year period of space shuttles, right? But if you could do with simulation, with the right environmental things, knowing that at that launch pad, the temperature was 30 degrees, right? And at that temperature, materials have this crazy property, things can explode, you could have predicted it would fail. That is the power. With, with uh, database, can, you have limited diagnosis capability. There are these really complicated machines, and what is happening inside that part, we have people here from, from land research. You have people here from, uh, uh, from uh, applied materials. Right? These are really complex machines with plasma etching and so on. What is happening inside that plasma state? You cannot actually measure that. Through simulation, you can. So that is sort of the point of digital twins. Right? You can do all kinds of stuff. With, you can simulate based on data. You can essentially create virtual sensors. So the opportunities are very, very interesting, which is why I am personally very, very excited about, about this opportunity. Right? So now, what we have done at ANSYS is to start a project in this area to go after that 3 billion or whatever market, after that 80 billion asset, right? So it is super, super useful. This is sort of one slide that also shows the range of simulation things that we have at ANSYS, right? So ANSYS, we have very good, sort of the number one structural simulation tool. We have the number one fluid simulation tool. We have the number one electromagnetic simulation tool, the semiconductor simulation tool. So in whatever field you have these assets, it can be modeled by that structural physics or the, or the fluid physics or the multi-physics interactions of the asset. It doesn't matter. If there is a physical element, we can model it through simulation. Once you model it through simulation, you can build a digital twin and do interesting predictions of when that thing is going to fail. That's why we are interested. So we have actually built this product called a, a or building this product called the Twin Builder, and I will not go into the details, but the key thing is that there's three steps. We build a digital twin model. Normally, our simulation things take forever to run because we use finite element methods, using the S and so on. It'll take like 10,000 hours to run one simulation of it, right? So what you do is a bunch, run a bunch of simulations. You build what is called a reduced order model. So if the temperature is 30 degrees, the rocket will fail after 20 hours. If the temperature is 100 degrees, it will fail after one minute. And if the temperature is 200 degrees, it will fail next second. That's how you have characterized through a reduced order model. If I knew the input, I can predict it. Now that one-to-one -one correlation you do through a lot of physics-based simulation. Now through an IoT platform, all you have to do is to measure the temperature. The temperature is 20 degrees, oh, I do a table lookup, this is what it is, right? 
So it's a combination of physics-based modeling and IoT that will do these amazing things in the world of IoT. That is what we are doing. We have performed partnerships with the BTCs, uh, ThingWorks platform, SAP's uh, platform. We have just announced a partnership with Microsoft Azure. So this is kind of how we are doing it, right? Combining an IoT platform to connect the assets to the simulation to make amazing predictions at accuracies of 95%. So now the question is, so what's, what have we applied? We have applied to a whole bunch of application areas like fluid stations, et cetera, et cetera. Now the question is, we are here not to talk about large industrial assets. We are here talking about semiconductor. So within the semiconductor business, right, we have been working on it for the last sort of 50 years. But today, the challenges that the opportunities are, semiconductor chips we use in mobile chips, right? In HPC chips, in AI chips. We just had an idea from yesterday. We learned about this this company called uh, Cerebras, they're doing some really amazing things with 1.2 trillion transistors on a chip. Oh my God, that's a lot of transistors, right? So how do you create a digital twin of a Cerebras chip? It's just crazy. And then opportunities in automotive and 5G. And then there's that opportunity in terms of the technology, seven nanometer technology, 3D ICs, ultra low bile. Then, so that, to simulate it, you have to simulate the power, the power integrity, timing, etc. So it's, this is a really, really rich, complicated area. So which brings us to the topic of our panel, which is digital twins applied to a semiconductor industry. The industry is going through transformation. All the challenges, the opportunities that I talked about are real. And so that is the motivation. We are going to talk about digital twins in the semiconductor industry. By assembling, we have put, put together a very, very interesting panel. And I want the panelists to join me uh, right now. So first panelist, and we're going to bring you all here, Gianluca, please. Gianluca Iaccherino is a professor at, uh, at Stanford in mechanical engineering. He's also the director, second chair, <coughs> yes. Uh, so he's the director of the uh, ICME Center, the Institute for Computational Material Engineering. Engi oh, yeah, that is, <laughs> that is the cerebrus. This is a wafer scale integration, right? Large die. Just imagine, 1.2 trillion transistors for AI and machine learning. So they'll take a, a TensorFlow, whatever application, or PyTorch, with a compiler, compile that application onto this machine. And so this will drive AI applications even more faster. But now, Okay, this thing can fail. <coughs> when it fails, bad things will happen, so we can build a digital grid of a thing like this as well. Thank you so much for doing this. It's equivalent to 400,000 GPU cores. So, uh, going on with, young Luca has a tremendous record, right? So he has a PhD from Italy. He did his postdoc at Center for Turbulence Research at Stanford. Became a faculty member, got the most prestigious presidential uh, PCAS award. He's a really, really well-known researcher in this field. And two weeks ago, we had our ANSYS TechCon conference. A plenary keynote was given by Jan Luka. Thank you for, for joining us. So we're going to start with Jan Luka giving a sort of an academic view. He's really an expert in this area, right? Next, we have Sanjay Chowdhury. Sanjay, please join us. He's uh, joining us from NVIDIA, but he's got an amazing uh, background. He has a PhD from Maryland, he is from the next, after that, after the case. Uh, uh, Maryland, then he, this one, here, in order. <laughs> I'm the professor, I'm used to sort of <laughs> students, but students don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> then he joined MSC, he's had a fantastic career at MSC, then he started his own company that was bought by ESI. So he is like the ultimate simulation whatever expert. And now he's working at NVIDIA. NVIDIA, as you know, makes these GPU chips that have created the whole field of AI, right? AI and machine learning. So we think the future is of AI is with GPUs. Not quite. We've got Sudip Nag from uh, Xilinx. He is going to say, well, we should not do that using uh, GPUs. We should do it with FPGAs. <laughs> so uh, Sudip actually is. Uh, from, uh, from the same IIT, I'm from IIT Kharagpur, and uh, he did his PhD from Carnegie Mellon. I know his advisor very well, and then he worked at Texas Instruments and uh, many, many years at, at 
And Zalix is a corporate VP responsible for AI software and all kinds of good stuff. So he is going to educate us about the opportunities here in this area. Then we have Malik Tatmakula here, a good friend of mine, the CTO of, of Ericsson Silicon Valley. He also has an amazing record. He studied at IIT Madras, then he came to uh, University of Tokyo, did his PhD, worked in a lot of networking companies, Juniper Networks, F5 Networks, was at Ericsson Research, and now doing amazing things at Ericsson. Finally, we have Karthik, another professor. He's an associate professor of aerospace engineering at University of Michigan. He also has an amazing uh, background. And, uh, but the reason he's here is sort of we have got two faculty members backing each other, right? <laughs> two academics. But here is a, a, an academic who has started a company. Actually, Jan Luka has done many, many companies himself. But he's going to talk about from an academic perspective Karthi will talk about academic becoming an entrepreneur. So he is the co-founder of, uh, of Geminus. So we have a really interesting panel, right? Chip company, <coughs> NVIDIA, doing GPUs, enabling AI machine learning. Oh, by the way, all the stuff that we'll do, will if we do it right in terms of AI, ML, applied to simulation, they could use it to build the next generation GPU chips at NVIDIA. Same thing for for it, so Xilinx. And oh, by the way, the, all these technologies are used in a system at Ericsson, right? All the 5G network that you have, right, with, you, with a combination of GPUs and FPGs and so on. So I think this is going to be a fun, fun panel. With that, I would like to ask uh, each of the panelists to, to say a few words. Uh, so we're going to start with Jan Luca talking about what he sees as the opportunities for simulation talk about AI machine learning, talk about some of the practical use cases of simulation. And I'm going to give you the clicker. Thank you. You can stand. You can thank you, Preet, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am. Uh, you can take the mic here. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Oops, this is oh. the challenge. Okay. So, um, like disclaimer, I am a mechanical engineer. I, I know a little bit about semiconductor industry, but not too much. So this my discussion here is going to be at a, dev, a level that is a little bit uh, perhaps higher than what you can expect in, in these kind of discussions. But the, the truth is that I wanted to at least say a few words about, about the institute I'm part of. I'm the director of the uh, ICN Institute at Stanford. And, and the reason for that is because it's a, it's a um, uh, interdisciplinary institute that is really connecting uh, data science and computing, so sort of the simulation science that uh, Preet was talking about with sort of the emerging field of data science. And um, the, the other thing that makes it interesting is that it's an is a institute that sits in the School of Engineering. So we are one of the School of Engineering departments, if you like. But we are very interdisciplinary. So we have faculty that are actually from all the six schools of, uh, of at Stanford, so School of Medicine, Business, and um, the School of Earth Sciences and so on. And this gives you, gives me and, and the students in this institute a really broad view of not just technology and challenges in algorithms, but also something that comes with using novel technology in the world and, in, and the impact that some of this technology can have. So that's, a, that's an interesting insight that I'll, I'll try to share with you uh, as we move forward. Uh, don't want to say too much about uh, the uh, numbers here. Obviously, if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the institute is very interdisciplinary and the research is very interdisciplinary. And so this is just a, a small sample that gives you a sense of sort of the way we apply um, algorithms, computing, and data science in, in across sort of the, the, the spectrum of, of uh, engineering <coughs> application, but also societal and uh, uh, technological problems. Now, the other thing that ICV does uh, uh, very well, in my opinion, is disseminating knowledge and, and challenges, um, not just at Stanford, but in the community. Um, and so uh, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, one thing specifically, this AI in real life uh, uh, seminar series that we, we ran last quarter, last, uh, last year, sorry. Uh, and we're running again next quarter um, in, uh, on campus. It's, it's actually a free seminar series. If anybody is welcome and you, you know, can, can join. Um, and uh, we invite uh, um, 
basically a spectrum of, of different individuals, typically from industry, but sometimes from NGOs or from, uh, from national labs, to tell uh, stories about applications, in this case of, uh, of uh, learning, and machine learning and AI technology to real world problems and, and what actually are the lessons learned there. And so in, in talking to Brit, I thought that, that would be an interesting thing to do for me to tell you a little bit about um, my experience with that. Uh, personally, I come from the simulation world, so these are some of the uh, example applications that I've worked on in my, in my you know, prior life as a, as a researcher. Um, so all these are you know, fitting what Britt was talking about in terms of multi-physics simulation. These are e extremely uh, complex problems um, in which we are using basically brute force computing, if you like, very large scale computing to try to get as accurate an answer as possible. And the, the objective of this simulation is, is sort of mentioned here. Is on one end virtual prototyping, so you're asking what is the best design to achieve a certain goal, or you're trying to do certification by analysis. You're asking the question that Prit was asking, is this system failing? What is the failing rate? What is the, the um, robustness and so on? And these are the, this has been sort of a growing field. Obviously, ANSYS is a leader in this field, but there is an enormous market for this kind of application of, of brute force simulation, if you like, to, to real world engineering. But uh, rather than uh, focusing on simulation, I, I wanted to, you know, my, my message for you is that um, I, I think digital twins are, 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 the, are an inevitable f future, basically. There is absolutely no way that this is not going to happen. The question is the time, the time scale of things. Uh, if you think of uh, sort of uh, engineering, you know, drawings were sort of where engineering started. And, and simply the advent of computers sort of made CAD sort of a reality. And, and you know, now CAD is, is completely um, <coughs> inevitable, if you like, in any engineering practice, right? And similarly, computers and the growth of computers, the more law and supercomputing in general, made simulation inevitable. There is absolutely no question that any field of engineering, and not just engineering, is affected by the simulation world. And so, what enables and what makes digital twins inevitable is actually big data. The fact that we have data, we have sensors, we have all that at the 